My name is Ricky. I'm one of the pastors that, that serves here. Good to be with you guys this morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Have, um, do you ever get sick and tired of hearing the, the same old thing again and again and somebody just repeating themselves again and again? Uh, a week and a half ago, I was one of the first 100 at the new Chick-fil-A that, that, uh, that got to spend the night uh, overnight in the, the frigid, super cold air. Um, and so there's this lady that was, was kind of running the show, and she had the microphone, and she just kept repeating, her, repeating the rules so many times. She'd get up there and be like, okay, hey, um, you cannot leave the premises or you'll be disqualified. If you want to go to your car, you cannot. You, you cross that ribbon, you're out. You're DQ'd. Boom. Um, hey, we're going to give you a card and don't lose the card because the card will give you another card and don't lose that card because we will not replace the card that gives you the card. Eventually, they get you the chicken. Don't lose the card, you know, all of these things. Or hey, and, and this card will, that gives you the eventual card to get the chicken. It's only for original. You cannot substitute it for a spicy. Um, I'm like at South they would. Um, you, know, uh, you know, you can't substitute it for anything. It's just an original chicken. Don't ask, don't do this. And I mean, repeatedly over, we'd, we'd get in these lines and they'd count us. And it's just all the time. And it's super cold out there. You're just, and then she'd just repeat them again. And then our eyes would just kind of roll. And then we'd not, not actually ask her the questions, but just kind of joke around amongst ourselves and like pretend to ask her the question like, oh, hey, so, wait, so can I run to Walmart real quick and come back? Or, you know, hey, what if I lose the card? Can you just replace the card? Can I substitute it for a salad? Is that okay? Um, <clears throat> you know, because you're just trying to have fun with it. But she just, even though it was kind of annoying that she's repeating herself so often, she was doing it on purpose because she's like, hey, you came here to get these, these free, you know, 52 chicken sandwich meals. And if you, don't, if you don't follow these rules, you don't get it. So she's just repeating it, saying like, hey, you got to get this to complete it. So you, you, it. It's not an option for you to not understand. So she just keep repeating herself over and over. Now, is there something that is so important for you today, right now, something so important that God is actually going to repeat himself in Scripture because God is telling you, you have to get this? This is so important for you to understand, for you to grasp, for you to cling to. I'm going to say it again so that you get it. With that, open up your Bibles to Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we'll take a look. Verse 1, for since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead a true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, if it could do that, would they have not have ceased to been offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So first point is our insufficient trying. Our insufficient trying. And so the, these old sacrifices, this, this old system, the law, they weren't the real thing. They're these shadows, and they're pointing ultimately what is to come to the true thing, and that's to Jesus, to something greater. And, and <clears throat> these old sacrifices, when they would sacrifice these animals, they didn't completely deal with sin. They didn't completely take it away. And because it wasn't permanent for sin, they have to be offered continually over and over again, right? And we've been talking about this in the book of Hebrews, and, and the author's saying, hey, otherwise, right, like if they had completely dealt with the sin, wouldn't they have stopped offering them over and over again, right? And that, that's just kind of the argument that he's saying, hey, they would have stopped offering these sacrifices if they would have actually dealt with sin permanently, if they would have offered uh, forgiveness, and so the question is, is if these old sacrifices didn't actually pay for sin, didn't actually cleanse the people of their guilt, of their shame, what did they do? What were they good for? And in verse 3, it says, but in these sacrifices, they were reminders of sin, right? So they were there to show the people of their sinfulness, to remind them of of their sin. Now, this is kind of hard for us to grasp. I don't know if you've been feeling this in the book of Hebrews, um, but it, it, it's just this huge disconnect for us. We don't really have an equivalent today of these Old Testament, Old Covenant sacrifices 
for us today. We don't have like, you know, a tabernacle where this, these sacrifices being made day after day, year after year. Um, <clears throat> I mean, for us, there's just this disconnect. Uh, this past week when we we're going through sermon prep, Mo and I were talking about this movie, Multiplicity, starring Michael Keaton. You should watch it. Um, and, and we're like having all these inside jokes, and we're like, oh, yeah, hey, remember the time? Hey, Steve. <laughs> and, you know, we're like laughing. And the rest of the, the staff hasn't seen the movie, so they're just like, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, that's funny. And then we just keep going with it, and it's even funnier. And it's like, oh, gosh, that part's even better. And the rest of the staff's like, I don't get it, you know, because they haven't seen the movie. And for us, reading about these Old Testament sacrifices and everything, it's kind of like we haven't seen the movie, so to speak. And so we just feel this disconnect from it. But, but all these sacrifices were this reminder of sin for them. I mean, that's a pretty legit way to be reminded of your sin, of how you've fallen short of God. I mean, again, think about it. You have this temple, you have this tabernacle, you know that, that you're, you're bringing this animal to it. And you're like, hey, I'm bringing this goat, this lamb, and this thing's going to be killed. This thing's going to be burnt. You see, you see all the smoke. You have all this smell from it. And all of this is to remind you, hey, you're sinful, right? I mean, and, and these animals are being offered. I mean, you, can you imagine our love for animals today if it was like, if we just got placed back then? You'd have Sarah McLaughlin, you know, all these, showing all these pictures of like these sad looking goats and lambs and stuff and like, I will remember you, you know, and it's just like, it, you know, and we're just thinking it's a goat. Like, um, <clears throat> but that's what's going on. And I mean, like all of these, th there's these priests and there's this annual day of atonement and there, hey, there's this curtain, there's this holy place and no one could go in there except once a year. And it, I mean, it's a, this big ordeal. And it's such this tangible way for the people to be reminded of their sin and, and that God is completely holy, he's perfect, he's good, just to remind them of their sin. And, and so we don't have that, but, but what reminds you of your sin? What's kind of this thing, you know, you, maybe you see that person and it just reminds you of some of the mistakes that have happened. Maybe you look in the mirror and it's just this kind of reminder of some of the things that you've done. And you just feel kind of this guilt and this shame. Maybe it's when you see that screen over there, it just reminds you of some of the, the things of how you've messed up. Maybe you actually are just around somebody that really is following Jesus and really not choosing some of those things and you feel the guilt and you don't actually want to be around them because... They're not acting like you, and so you withdraw from those people that are actually following Christ because you just are reminded of some of the mistakes and the choices that you're currently making, right? We, we all feel that sometimes. We all feel this reminder of our sin, of our, of our guilt and our shame, and when we feel that, we all try to deal with it in some way. We try to get rid of it. Hey, I'm going to try to solve it. And, and, you know, we, we tell ourselves something like this, like, okay, hey, I feel this way. I know some of the things I've done. Hey, I'm going to try to not be bad for a while. Hey, for this month, I'm going to really buckle down, and I'm not going to do that thing that I've been doing. Hey, for this month, I'm not going to be around that person. I'm not going to look at that thing. Hey, I'm not going to cuss a ton. I'm not going to yell at my kids. Hey, I'm not going to drink so much. Whatever it is, you know, so, because then, hey, if, if I don't do those things, then I'll feel better about myself. Or, or maybe we try to really be good for a while. Hey, I'm going to make sure I go to church. I'm going to make sure I go to my city group. I'm going to make sure I read the word. And because we're kind of performing well enough, then we, we feel better about ourselves because we're trying to deal with it. And, and the people here, they had this religious system. Hey, if you offer these sacrifices, it doesn't actually pay for sin, but but what it showed was, hey, this is actually insufficient to deal with your sin. Verse 4, it says, but in these sacrifices, or, or, or verse, verse 4, for it is impossible, not kind of, not mostly, but impossible for the blood of bulls and goats, these sacrifices, to take away your sin. You can't deal with it. No matter how well you be moral or, or do all the religious checks, it's not going to deal with your sin. It's insufficient. And that's what religion 
when, when it really becomes kind of a religious thing for us, that's what it makes us feel, right? It makes us feel like we have the power. Hey, if I'm good enough, if I do things the right way or don't do the bad things, then I can, I can deal with my sin. I can make myself right with God. And verse 4 is just saying, no, you can't. It's actually impossible. No matter how hard you try, it's totally impossible. It's impossible to be good enough to take away your sin. It's impossible to go to church enough times to take away your sin. It's impossible for you being baptized to take away your sin. It's impossible for, hey, just don't do some really bad things to take away your sin. Or, it's, hey, it's impossible if you just want to ignore your sin completely and just think that God just accepts everybody because he's just a loving God and why would he be just or any of those things. Yeah, that's actually impossible for you to just think that and think that's actually going to take away your sin and deal with it. And so we, we need something more, more than ourselves, more than our insufficient trying, more than our own means, more than any of these religi- religious check marks to actually take away sin and to make us right with God. It's all insufficient. We need something better, which brings us to our second point, Christ's sufficient dying, Christ's sufficient dying. Look at verse five. So consequently, meaning, hey, hey, because of all of this stuff in verse four, meaning you can't take away your sins, it's not going to work. Hey, because of all that, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in the sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he, he added, behold, I will have come to do your will. And so we need a better sacrifice and God provided that. And so in verses five through seven, this is from Psalm 40. And the author here is saying, Jesus said this. When Christ came, he said this. Now, the weird thing about that is in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nowhere is it actually recorded that Jesus said these words. So what is the author trying to tell us if it actually doesn't show that Jesus said these things? First, Jesus is saying, hey, Jesus is a member of the Trinity. Jesus is fully God, and he's the author of Scripture. Also, he's showing us how to interpret the Old Testament correctly. Yes, this is in the Old Testament, and yes, this, Jesus doesn't actually say this in the Gospels, but this is being said by Jesus because it's pointing forward to him coming. And so Jesus is, 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 is saying this, like verses 5 through 7, kind of like, hey, this is my mission. I'm here to do the will of the Father. We see that in verse 7, to offer myself as the ultimate sacrifice. Hey, consequently... Because of all this stuff, religion, your trying, it's all insufficient. It's all not going to make you right with God. I'm coming to do the will of the Father, and that's to offer myself as the one, once and for all, sacrifice for sin. And then this part where he says in um, verse 6, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, or later on he says, burnt offerings, sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. That doesn't mean that the old, old covenant sacrifices are wrong. I mean, God's the one that commanded them to do those things. But what it is saying is that these old sacrifices, they're never going to make you righteous. They're never going to make you right with a holy God. Doing just the, the religious things, that isn't a substitute for actually a changed heart and a changed life. You know, at times I thought, hey, it wouldn't be too bad if we actually had a little bit of this old system still today. You know, if we, if we had, a, you know, kind of a, this cool temple and all the smoke's pouring out of it, you know, because animals are being, you know, sacrificed and stuff, that's not because I, you know, want to see animals sacrificed or anything like that. Um, but, again, it's just such this tangible reminder of sin. Hey, I mean, can you imagine just one time a year we, we would have this priest and he's all, all dolled up and has all the, you know, the, the ephod with the, with the 12 stones and all this, this big get up. 
And if just one time a year we had this such this tangible reminder of, hey, he's going to go in there behind the curtain into, into the presence of God and, and he's going to make sacrifice for himself. And, and in there's the Ark of the Covenant and all these, these sacred special things. And he's going to pour blood out on there and then he's going to come out and then he's going to get this lamb that represents our sin and he's going to sacrifice it for all of our sin this one time a year. Man, that would, that would really be kind of an impacting thing, Right? I mean, because we, we, many times in our culture, we tr- treat sin as pretty trivial. Hey, s- sin is no longer sin. Sin's just a mistake. Hey, I'm just being human. Hey, it's no big deal. Hey, I don't even know if God thinks it's a big deal because God's just love. Right? We tend to view sin that way. But if we had this kind of Old Testament thing with sacrificing animals, you know, even just one time a year, man, that would really show us that sin is such a big deal and that God is so good, so holy, right? Wrong. Because the people in the Old Testament, they did have that. And what was meant to be a reminder of their sin and a reminder of the goodness and holiness of God, it just became a religious exercise for them to do. It's just a hoop for them to jump through. What was meant to be something for them to to show them the goodness of God came to mean almost nothing for them. They're just going through the motions. And so when when, when Jesus says, hey, I don't don't actually desire these sacrifices because they're actually, they're nothing to you right now. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. He says, this people, my people, they honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Hey, people can say the right things. They they can offer the right sacrifices to God. But God is after the heart, not these just religious exercises for people to check off. And it just came to mean nothing to them. They're just going through the motions. I mean, do do you ever struggle with that? Just going through the motions because, hey, that's what we're supposed to do. Hey, come to church, worship God, sing a song, hear a sermon, check. Now I can go home. Done. Go back to just regular life. Hey, I opened up the Bible, say a little prayer, check. Now everything's okay because I did what I'm supposed to do. Right? And we, we just kind of go through the motions. And we, and we do this, one, because we have this small, faulty view of God. We just think that God maybe just isn't really interested in us or how we worship Him. And we just think that God, hey, God, you're just happy if I just kind of do the right behavior, right? And, and we make God, we, we take God, that this, this amazing, incredible, all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God, and we've taken him and we make him a hobby. Hey, I'll do this on Sunday. This is God time. And then now I'm going to go back to regular life, back to my time with my friends, my job, whatever it is. Something I just do in my spare time. God's a stupid hobby. Right? I mean, if, if I was going to pick a hobby, I wouldn't pick God. I'd be like skydiving. <laughs> Something cool. Actually, I probably do have a hobby, and it's kind of dumb, too. It's Star Wars. But um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of that. Like, maybe it's not that good. But, but God's not a hobby. He's the one that gives us real life, real joy, real life. Jesus says in John 10, he says, the thief, the enemy, The the ways of this world, they come to steal, kill, and destroy. They're coming to rob you of joy, of real life, of real meaning, of real purpose. Of all the things that are ultimately best for you, the most life-giving thing, that's what they're taking away from you. But Jesus says, but I have come. The reason I'm here is to not be a hobby, not to be this little spare time thing, but I have come to give you life, real life, life to the full Right? Don't, don't let your small, faulty view of God put him in this little box and make him a hobby that you can and then just go through the motions with religious stuff. I mean, the other reason that, that we tend to go through the motions is because we have low expectations. 
What do you expect when you come to church on a Sunday? Or when you go to your city group? Or when you open God's word? Or when you pray to the holy God? Do you expect God is going to speak to me? God is going to do something. When you go to work, when you go to class, when you go to school, are you thinking that God is alive and active and wants to do something in you, wants to do something around you and through you to the people in your life? Do you expect God to show up? Or is he just something that we read about in a book that happened thousands of years ago? God's alive. He cares. He wants to do more amazing things in you and through you than you can possibly imagine. Do you expect God to do something? Right? Be expecting him to do it. And so God, he's not after just these these sacrifices that they were offering up just as these kind of religious things to do. They didn't ultimately change the people's hearts. They didn't ultimately take away sin. God was after this greater sacrifice that was going to actually change people, to save people, to make a permanent payment for sin that would please him. And that's Jesus. And then we see in verse 9, then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. Again, Jesus is saying, hey, this is why I'm here. I'm here for God's will, to God to be glorified. He does away with the first order to establish the second. Jesus came as an ultimate substitute and payment for sin. Jesus died on the cross and paying the price for our sin. He does away with the first covenant, away with that old stuff to bring the new covenant. And then in verse 10, and by that will, by what Jesus has done, his will, we have been, and then underline, circle, highlight all this, sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Here, the, here Paul uses this, this word sanctified, and here in, ver, in verse 10, he's talking about it kind of like how Paul talks about justified in the book of Romans, meaning you are declared not guilty, you're, you're made right with God. And so we have been, we who have trusted in Christ, we've been sanctified, we've been made right with God, declared not guilty through, not through good works, not through going to church enough, not through some religious activity, none of that, making sure we do the right things, but it is through, what does it say? The body, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I mean, this shows us that, that we've been made right, that we've been received by God, not by our insufficient trying, not by us trying to clean ourselves up or fix ourselves, but totally by the sufficient death of Jesus. That's what you've been made right with. That's what we've been sanctified with. And and then it says, once for all. This is a very important phrase in, in the book of Hebrews. The author is saying, loud and clear, this is permanent. Once for all. Jesus' death is definitive. It is sufficient. No other thing needs to be offered. No other sacrifice. Jesus has made it once for all. And so he, he tells us here, the, the, the author tells us about not just the sufficiency of Jesus' death, but he also goes on to tell us about the effectiveness of Jesus' death. So verse 11, and every high priest stands daily at his service. He stands because his work is never done. He has to continue to make these sacrifices over and over again. Offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had, had offered for all time a single, a permanent, an all-sufficient sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God because his work's done. The atoning work is done. Jesus said, it is finished, paid in full because it's sufficient. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. In other words, everything that Christ came to accomplish will be accomplished. No one is getting in Jesus' way. Whatever he says that he is coming to do, he will do. All of his promises are yes in Jesus. They will not be stopped. The atonement was utterly complete. The Father was utterly satisfied. And the enemies of Christ will utterly fall before him. And then in verse 14, for a single offering, he has 
perfected, underline, circle, highlight, perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And then verse 15, and uh, the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us after, for us uh, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts, I'll write it on their minds. Then he adds, I'll remember their sins no more, or remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. So third point is that Christ's death sanctifying. Christ's death sanctifying. So sanctification, it has two aspects of it. There's positional sanctification, and then there's progressive sanctification. And we see both of these in this passage. So first we'll look at positional sanctification. Again, verse 14. For by a single offering, Jesus, he has perfected. That's past tense, right? That's something that's already been done, already been completed. He's perfected us. And so not improved, not made slightly better, but perfected. And and this points us back to to verse 10 as well, that Christ has earned our perfection. You're, You're in right relationship with God if you've trusted in him permanently. Our right standing with God, being made right with him, is this once for once for all that comes through the sacrifice of Christ. And so through faith, we, we are now identified with Jesus. We have this union with Christ because of what he has done for us. And we've been so identified with him, it's as if we've actually fulfilled the will of God perfectly. This is what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. It says, for our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, right? Jesus becomes our sin so that in him, we, those who've trusted in Christ, might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, as our substitute, our sin goes on him. He, He became sin for us. He's punished, pays the price for our sin. And then his righteousness, his obedience, him fully following God the Father, that righteousness comes to us is credited to us. That's awesome. I mean, think about that. Every moment that God thinks about you, looks at you, he doesn't see the ways that you've messed up this past week. He sees his son. You're in Christ, unified with Christ, identified with Christ, not by your junk, not by your sin, but by the righteousness of of Christ. He loves you like he loves his son, Jesus. This permanent right standing with God, credited with the righteousness of God. And then he goes on, he just to emphasize it more, verse 17, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Verse, verse 3, it says these sacrifices that were offered, they were to actually remind the people of sin. But Jesus comes and says, hey, I don't want you to, it's not those sacrifices that remind you of your sin, it's my sacrifices that help me not remember your sin. Right, those old sacrifices, they remind you of sin. Jesus comes and gives us communion and says, remember now the sacrifice that's been given to you. Right, that's amazing. No longer are these sins held against you. In, in, in sermon prep, Bob, one of the guys on our advisory team, he, um, he said, Sin t- the, Jesus takes sin from the windshield and it puts it in the rear view. It's no longer in front of us, it's completely behind us. Jeremy, our worship leader here at Central, he said, we only remember sin in light of forgiveness and never in light of our condemnation. Right? We're no longer condemned because of our sin. And so if God is no longer condemning you for your sin, you shouldn't either. Right? If you're ever feeling condemned for your sin, that's not from God. That's your own guilt and your own shame, not trusting in what he has done for you. We're completely forgiven, completely made right with God, and that's our position with God, and it doesn't change because you've had a bad week. It's permanent, totally identified with him. So from this positional sanctification, our, our permanent relationship, position with Christ... That positional sanctification, right standing with God, comes our progressive sanctification. Now, progressive sanctification means we're we're becoming more like Jesus in how we actually live, how we think, how we act. 
We're continually being changed, being transformed to the image of Christ in our desires, our delights, and our words. But let me emphasize this to just make this completely clear. Progressive sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, comes from your position with Christ. Your positional sanctification, your relationship with God, what Jesus has done for you, made you, that leads to you becoming to more like Christ, not the other way around. You can't muster it up and like, be like, hey, I'm going to try to become more like Jesus to help my position with him. It doesn't work that way. It's not your earning. It's totally you learning to follow Jesus. Again, look at verse 14. It says, for a, by a single offering, he has perfected, past tense, our position for all time, those who are being present, ongoing, being sanctified, being changed, being more like Christ. Verse 15, he says, hey, I've given you my law in your hearts and your minds. I've given you my spirit. Again, he's quoting from Jeremiah 31, like he did in chapter 8. We've been given the Holy Spirit that is in us, living in us, changing us. Help us follow Jesus and obey him. Christ didn't come and die, pay the price for sin and raise again just for you to go to heaven. It's not, hey, get the ticket so you could go to the good place. I've come to give you myself, to give you new life, to, to transform you, to change you, to give you myself so that you can experience the life of Christ. This is what it says in 1 Peter 2, 24. It says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross, paid the price for it, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He, he frees us from our sin and that we're forgiven, that, that we're made right with God, that we're, but also that we might no longer sin and live to righteousness, live to Christ, becoming more like Jesus. And so the question is this, does your faith, does your relationship with God, your position with him because of what he's done for you, your right standing with God, does that make you more eager to forsake sin and become like Jesus? Does your relationship with God actually change you, transform you? Maybe not completely, but, but, but it's helping change you because of who you are in Christ. Do you hate your sin, the things that are not like Christ? Even if it's just the things that you want, the things that you desire, or the things that, that aren't there in your life of, of wanting to love others, wanting to serve others, does, does, does your do you hate your sin just because it's bad or because it's not who you really are in Jesus? If, if that's true of you, if you're just saying, you know what, yeah, I don't, I don't really want to become more like Christ. That this really hasn't characterized my life for kind of a, a while, for a long time, for maybe months and months or years. And I don't really, I don't really care about repenting, turning away from my sin and turning to God. I, I just want to encourage you with a few things. One, I just want to encourage you, if that's you, you might not know Jesus. I'm not, I'm not saying that, again, because like, hey, you're not behaving well enough, so then you don't know Christ. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying because there's not this actual change, the, 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 some sort of showing actual affection for Christ, it might be because you don't know him. And, and if, you know, just be honest with yourself. Man, have you really trusted in Christ? Or are you just kind of like doing a little bit of what some of what they were struggling with and just kind of doing some religious stuff? If that's you, I, I, you know, and, and you do know Christ, I just encourage you, look closer at Christ. Look more deeply at how amazing he is and who he's made you. Right? We're transformed by beholding the image of Christ. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Also, I... I want you to realize that becoming more like Jesus, being changed, it does take effort. You, you participate with God. You cooperate with God in him changing you. Yes, it is totally by the power and the grace of God that we are changed. What he has done motivates us, moves us to follow him, to surrender. But you're not going to be able to just keep sitting on your butt and becoming more like Jesus. That's just not going to happen. Right? You, you move towards God. You, you surrender to him through, through the grace-driven effort in this. And if that is you, just confess that and ask God, man, I just need your help. I'm really apathetic right now. 
right? You don't have, it's not just you alone doing this. Christ is with you. Christ, Christ is empowering you. So ask him for help. Even if you're like, I don't know if I really want to, but ask him for help. I mean, because maybe, maybe you're just more in love with your, your own schedule, your own laziness, your own sin, your own life more than you are Christ. Just ask him to help you in that. I love how this passage ends, verse 18. It says, where there is forgiveness of these, there's no longer any offering of sin. If Christ's death is sufficient, has given us this forgiveness of sin forever, then there's no reason for you to go back to your insufficient trying. There's no reason for you to try to kind of clean yourself up anymore or think that you can add to what God has done for you. But the reality is, is we kind of struggle with this because we struggle to receive grace and, and what God has done for us. If, if I've done something to my wife, Christy, said something I shouldn't have, just kind of maybe it was a jerk or something like that, I ask for forgiveness for her, and if she forgives me, but I still feel it. I still feel bad. And so even though she said, hey, yeah, I forgive you, and I want to show her even more how sorry I am. So I'm like, okay, hey, yeah, hey, you want a back rub? Hey, hey, I know that you've given me forgiveness, but my back rub will help, right? I mean, do you you ever notice things like that? Or do you ever notice that when somebody pays something for you, buys you something, you feel weird about it, especially if it's something big? The only time I feel about it, feel okay about it if somebody pays for me is if they're like super rich. I remember this time years ago, I was in the Dominican Republic on a mission trip, and we're in this small village. It's really poor. People are in poverty. And uh, me and another member of our team, we'd been talking to this guy, working alongside of him, um, getting to know him, sharing Jesus with him for for a week. And so at the end of it, he's like, hey, man, I'd love for you to come to my house. So the two of us, we go there, get to his house, and I mean, it's hardly anything. I mean, it's dirt floors. He doesn't have, it's not like he has electricity refrigerator, none of that. It's just like, yeah, you got a couple beds and your family just crams in this room. And so we get there and, and he gives something to a couple of his kids and they take off running. And we sit down, we start talking to him and his kids come back and they have two ice cold pops in glass bottles. And he hands them to us. Man, I felt weird. I'm like, no, no, let, you, know, you have it. Let's share him and his kids have nothing. They're not drinking one. It's just me and this other guy. We're the only ones with anything. And I feel guilty. I feel weird. Because I'm like, you're giving me something when you have nothing. But if you were rich, if you had tons of stuff, I'd feel better. Do you think that God is not rich enough in his grace, in his power to completely forgive you, to completely save you? Do you just think that he's just not good enough to give you everything that you have to add something to it? Or that you have to feel guilty for accepting the gift that God has given you in his son, Jesus Christ? Do you just think he's not rich enough? That you can't just accept it? His grace has no measure. His love has no limits. It is done completely by Christ's sufficient, once for all, death for you, his payment for sin, and you brought nothing to the table. And you can't bring anything to the table to like make yourself better with God, more acceptable to God, any of those things. It's totally by what Christ has done for you and the gift that he offers you in his death and resurrection. And maybe you're thinking, hey, Ricky, that sounds, I think I've heard this before. That sounds kind of repetitive. This chapter's repetitive. It is. And God has done that completely on purpose, knowing that this week, tomorrow, you'll need to hear it and cling to it again. Because we forget, we we drift. I I know this stuff. I'm, I'm preaching about it. I've studied this passage, but you know what? I know that this this next week or sometime this next month, I'm going to sin, I'm going to mess up, and my first instinct is probably not to run to God. My first impulse in me is probably going to feel guilt and shame, and I'm going to want to hide from God. Even though God has already told me in his word, with God, confidence, approach me with total freedom. Approach me because you're forgiven. There's no guilt. There's no shame. Why? Because I took that from you. You're my kid. You're mine. I've paid it all for you. 
Believe that. Come to me right away when you mess up. I got to cling to it. I got to remind myself over and over the truths of the gospel. Maybe you've heard, maybe you haven't, you, you haven't trusted in Christ and you've heard this again and again. What are you waiting for? You haven't responded to Christ in faith. Like, there's nothing else that you could turn to that's going to take away your sin. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't clean yourself up. Anything else that you turn to, your, turn to in this world, even yourself, will not make you right with God. Will not offer you real life, real joy, real freedom. But Christ says, I have come and I've died in your place to give you everything not because you deserve it, not because you're in it, and you don't have to, I've done it for you. And if you haven't trusted in Christ, man, he's, God's repeating himself to you again today to say, I want you to get this so bad. Trust in me. And if you're thinking about that, if you have questions, I mean, talk to somebody. Just talk to God. I mean, talk to somebody and say, hey, I, I think I want, I want Christ. I don't know what to do. And if you have trusted in Christ, again, cling to this. Don't let, ever let the, the gospel and the truth of what Christ has done for you to ever become numb to it. Keep clinging to Christ and the amazing thing that he has given us in his son. Don't think that you're chipping into what God has done for you. It's completely Christ. And, and today we get to take communion today as a family, again, just to remember that Christ's blood was shed for us, his body was broken for us, and that the, the bread represents his body, the, the juice represents his blood that was shed for us, and that we're made completely right with Christ. And so if you've trusted in Christ your Savior, I want to invite you to, to do that. Also, if you just need some time to just reflect and kind of examine your heart, confess some sin, not because that just makes you right with God that you do it, but, but just to confess sin and, and to be reminded that he's forgiven you, you know, if you, if you need to do that before you come up or after you get back, you know, just do that when you sit there, just to examine yourself. But, but we, no longer do we have an altar up here. You know, in the Old Testament, the old ways, the old covenant, they had an altar because sacrifices still need to be made. We don't have an altar, we have a table because Christ invites us into the family, invites us into relationship with us. And that's what we have because of his, his death. So let's pray.